Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, for this Domestic Abuse Awareness Webinar. Um, it's been put together by Canterbury Community Safety Partnership and the Rising Sun. My name is Butler and I'm the lead for the Canterbury Community Safety Partnership from Canterbury City Council. And we're joined by Judith, the Fundraising and Communications Officer, and Anne, our, pre our presenter today, both from the Rising Sun. This webinar has been made available uh, today through funding from the Police Crime Commissioner's Office. Uh, and this webinar and su uh, supporting domestic abuse toolkit will be publicly available online in about a week after this uh, event today. Thank you very much again for joining us and I'm going to pass over to Judith. Thanks Scott. Uh, yeah, so I'm Judith I'm from the Rising Sun. Um, I'll be helping Anne with the presentation today and uh, as Scott said there will be time for questions at the end so if there's any questions I'll keep an eye on the um, chat so feel free to um, pop them in there and also um, we're well aware that uh, domestic abuse is uh, quite a challenging topic and it can be quite affecting for lots of people so if you feel in any way that you need some time out if you need to take a step away please do so um, to look after yourself um, and also if there's anything that is comes up from the session that you'd like to discuss with us afterwards and um, just send me a private message and we'll make sure to get in touch with you either by email or by a phone call to discuss anything through with you as well and what I'll do is I'll um, pass you over to Anne. Okay, welcome and um, thanks so much for um, giving us um, this time this afternoon for us to talk to you about um, domestic abuse. So I'm just going to share my screen. We'll be doing, um, we'll have a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation and we will um, be showing you um, a little short video as well um, throughout the thing. Oh dear, and that's gone wrong for me. Sorry. <laughs> Um, okay, it's gone wrong. Okay, let's try again. Ah, precious minutes. Yeah, it's disappeared. Okay, Judith, over to you a minute while I try and find it. Sorry. No problem. Sorry, it falls the way. Um, okay, so yeah, as Anne said, this is a um, training um, around domestic abuse awareness, especially looking at how um, we respond to domestic abuse um, within our communities. The community is the first uh, sort of, you know, we're a part of many different communities and there's an important role in responding to abuse. Um, I'm afraid I don't have the slides open either, Anne, so I'm not quite sure. Okay. It did okay. open. We're there. Oh, there you go. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, we can see that. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, sorry, my computer completely froze there in terms of that. So um, welcome to our presentation this morning. Any problem with sound or anything, just please um, um, talk to Judith. So we've got um, you know, less than an hour to go through something that's absolutely massive um, to talk to you about. So we're really just giving you a really schematic overview um, and touching on some points. But what we really want to do is kind of really be clear about what is domestic abuse, because if you're kind of learning about domestic abuse, the real key is to have a real um, understanding of of what that is. And so we hope that by the end of this webinar that you'll have a bit of an understanding about what is domestic abuse. And by that, I mean the kind of nature and the impact of domestic abuse, um, including um, coercive control. We want to kind of, we've put this out to our community because there's real power in our community to begin to really work together to address the issue of domestic abuse. We want people who are experiencing abuse to get the right response. So we want you to feel confident to respond to someone who is um, having a difficult time with domestic abuse or sharing their story to you. And we'll give you some tips for um, giving um, the right response. And then we're not asking people in our community to kind of start working with domestic abuse, but we want you to know where to refer people on for that specialist help and support that they need. So when we think about community, we all loosely and um, belong or identify to many different communities. Um, and your community can also be your professional um, setting as well. 
but we know for sure in our communities right across the UK and um, right across the world globally that domestic abuse is a major issue. And in our um, statistics from England and Wales, we see that 1.3 million each year women are affected um, by domestic abuse. But overwhelmingly, people who experience abuse tell us that there is no response to domestic abuse within the communities because people just don't talk about it and so when we see that kind of communities come together to help each other in need and we've you know we've seen that with the the recent COVID pandemic how people have pulled together and so we really want our communities to kind of really pull together and to help with this real issue of domestic abuse your community can be the street that you live in your kind of neighborhood it can be um, related to your ethnicity or race or your culture. Um, it could be your have a faith community, you go to a sports club or the music scene or hobby or lots of other projects that kind of um, make up community. But community is being part of something bigger than yourself. And so you know, collectively, we talk about domestic abuse, but individually, we don't. And there is no response, a response from the community about talking about domestic abuse. But, you know, we when we talk about domestic abuse and people who have experienced it, we use the term survivors. And so survivors really do need to be around conversations about domestic abuse in community so that that makes them makes it much much easier for them to begin to share their experience of domestic abuse we put this webinar on in our community because we want our communities to be gate openers rather than gate closers and we want to actively break that silence in the community about domestic abuse and when we break that silence we take the burden away from the survivor having um, to do that so that seeking help in our communities become normal and that we understand the difficulties that people who are experiencing abuse face and we want the first time that someone talks about abuse for that to be an opportunity for them to begin to get the help and support that they need. So often why one of the reasons why communities don't talk about domestic abuse is because that often it's trivialized and that we're focused on individuals rather than um, the harms that are caused by the attitudes and structures that underpin and cause domestic abuse. And we've heard quite a lot of that recently um, in the um, news with the Sarah Everard case that's gone on. So really, we got together with Canterbury City Council to put this webinar on because we really want to kind of break the silence in our community and remove the barriers that make it hard for survivors to tell others about their experience. So we, that's the first thing we want to do. We want to break that silence. We want people to be around conversations about domestic abuse. We want you after this webinar to be initiating conversations with family, friends, colleagues, just talking about domestic abuse. So we're kind of breaking the silence. We want to raise awareness. We want opportunities where what you've learned about and um, kind of domestic abuse that you can raise that awareness so that communities better understand domestic abuse. And if you take anything away from this webinar today, we want to create kind of safe spaces to discuss domestic abuse that can lead to people sharing their experience. But what's the most important thing for anyone in hearing someone talk about domestic abuse are uh, responding to that is to do it in a safe, appropriate and empathic way. So we want you to listen and believe with compassion and without judgment. And those are the really key things when you think about responding to domestic abuse. It's about listening, believing, and it's listening with compassion and without judgment. And that is so really kind of key to responding to domestic abuse. I've just got um, a couple of little quotes up here where, you know, it says that there's no such thing as the voiceless. 
they are only deliberately silenced or preferably unheard. And in our communities, if we're not breaking that silence about domestic abuse, then we are deliberately silencing and we're deliberately not listening to those people who are experiencing it. So we really want to break that silence. One of the things that we know from survivors is that there's a lot of shame for people who are experiencing abuse. And we want to take that away from them because shame cannot survive being spoken. And that's why it's really important for people to be speaking out about this issue. And that when um, shame is met with empathy, that, that really takes it away. And so empathy is just that ability to understand and share the feelings of another person and definitely Empathy is that real antidote to shame, guilt and blame. And we want to take that away from people in our community. So we want to really encourage you to have a kinder response to domestic abuse. So what is domestic abuse? We have, you know, cross government party and policy definitions um, around domestic um, abuse. And we know that domestic abuse can be committed by a partner, an ex-partner or a family member. Domestic abuse is really common and it takes many forms. And um, we'll look at that on the next slide of the forms that kind of take place. One of the things that's um, a really common control tactic in domestic abuse is coercive control. And coercive control was made an offence in December 2015. And we'll learn a bit more about what it means to be um, coercively controlled. But coercive control is when a person with whom you are personally connected repeatedly behaves in a way which makes you feel controlled, dependent, isolated, or scared. And so coercive control, one of the ways to think about domestic abuse and coercive control is to think about what is that person prevented from doing because of the abuse that they are experiencing. And often we have a shift or we have a focus on what the perpetrator is doing, but to really begin to think about what that person is prevented um, from doing and so when we um, think about domestic abuse, when we talk about a pattern of incidents of controlling coercive or threatening behavior, violence or abuse between those aged 16 or over, who have been intimate partners or family members, regardless of gender or sexuality. So domestic abuse incorporates coercive control, psychological and emotional abuse, digital and online abuse, stalking, physical abuse, sexual abuse, financial abuse, and harassment. So lots of those um, patterns of behavior is what makes up domestic abuse. But one of the things that we know about people who experience domestic abuse, they often don't realize that that's what they're ex experiencing. So survivors don't use this terminology, I'm experiencing coercive control, I'm experiencing domestic abuse. They will often say, you know, my partner is really jealous or they're really controlling. And so um, it's really important. That's why it's important to understand what it is so that you can unpick it with someone. And as we said, domestic abuse is a social and global problem that has significant impact on individuals, on families, on communities, and on society as a whole. And again, why we all need to work together to respond to domestic abuse. Where domestic abuse sits is that domestic abuse is one strand of the Violence Against Women and Girls framework. And I don't know if people have heard of the Violence Against Women and Girls framework. And um, every three years, the government will publish their violence against women and girls strategy and framework. And we've just had a recent publication in July of a renewed violence against women and girls framework. And when we talk about violence against women and girls, what we mean is that violence against women is a, a manifestation of that historical unequal power relationships between men and women, which led to the domination over and the discrimination against women by men. 
and that it's the preventing of the full advancement of women. And violence against women and girls is one of those crucial social mechanisms by which women are forced into subordinate positions compared with men. And in 1993, the United Nations, under their declaration of elimination of violence against women and girls, um, made that um, a crime and a human right. And um, the British government signed up to that. So violence against women and girls refers to different types of abuse that occur around the world that disproportionately affect women because they are women and are overwhelmingly perpetrated by men. But the violence against women and girls framework, I will say, does not exclude the fact that anyone can experience abuse and that anyone of any gender can perpetrate abuse and that needs to be responded to absolutely but the framework exists to reflect the gendered nature of the crime and it's made up of eight strands and so it's domestic violence and abuse sexual violence abuse and exploitation sexual harassment and bullying stalking trafficking and forced prostitution female genital mutilation forced marriage and crimes and committed in the name of honor. So if you're interested in ending domestic abuse, and I guess lots of you have come on this webinar today because you're really interested in the subject, then we would encourage you to be interested in ending all forms of violence against women and girls because they reinforce and uphold each other. And many women will experience multiple forms of abuse throughout their lives. And I do want to say that 100% violence against women and girls is not inevitable. It is preventable. Um, but we need to look at those structural causes that um, are the root cause of violence against women and girls. So, you know, it's important to note in terms of that um, this pie chart shows us that 84% of survivors of domestic abuse are women and 16% of survivors are men. And there are important differences between male violence against women and female violence against men. And namely, it's about the severity and the impact. So on average, we have two women who are killed by a partner or ex-partner every week in England and Wales. And we have, we've had 12 men killed um, on average each year. And we don't want any of those statistics um, for men or um, women. We do know that women will experience higher levels of coercive control um, than men. But we know that, as I said, domestic abuse can be perpetrated by anyone and can affect anyone. And every case of domestic abuse should be taken seriously and each individual given access to the support um, that they need. When we look at um, our LGB community, we can see that um, one in four um, lesbian and bi women have experienced domestic abuse in a relationship. 49% of all gay and bi men have experienced um, domestic abuse from a family member or partner since the age of 16. And a study from Scotland found that 80% of um, trans people have experienced domestic abuse from a partner or ex-partner. And another study showed that a quarter of British trans people, 28% in a relationship on the, in the last year, faced um, domestic abuse. So it's really important to see that right across all of our communities, people do experience um, domestic abuse. We know that for women from minoritized groups will also experience domestic abuse and disabled women and people with mental health problems experience higher levels of abuse um, as well. We don't have time to talk about children, but it's really important to kind of acknowledge this impact of domestic abuse that it has an impact on children and young people in our communities. And our latest statistics show that one in seven children will um, have experienced and lived in a home where there is um, domestic abuse. And we know that children have also been killed when they've been in child contact arrangements with a perpetrator of 
um, domestic abuse. So having worked in this field for a long time, one of the things that people commonly ask is how do people, you know, choose um, abusive partners? How do people end up in um, an abusive relationship? And um, the question that I always turn that around and said we should be asking, first of all, why are perpetrators still perpetrating this type of behavior in 2021 but people do ask this question and i think it's worth a kind of um answering the question so there's a process to an abusive relationships and abusive relationships don't start out as abusive and abusers may not be abusive all the time this is a little quote from um, Laura Levine, who is a radio DJ and um, does Desert Island Discs and um, probably much more popular things that I don't know about. But she talks very openly about her abusive relationship. And I think her quote of what she says here really sums up that process of how people get into an abusive relationship. And what Lauren says is what I remember the most about a emotional abuse is that it's like being put in a box and how you end up there is the biggest trick maybe you think it's a treasure box at first you're in there because you're special but soon the box begins to shrink and every time you touch the edges there's an argument so you try to make yourself fit you curl up you become smaller quieter remove the offensive parts of your personality you eliminate people and interests you change your behavior but still the box gets smaller you think it's your fault and that's the process so it's really not an incident it's a whole process of behaviors that kind of create domestic abuse you know she talked about how making yourself fit in isolation is what happens when you try to make yourself fit in that box. And then that isolation causes you to rely on the perpetrator. And it's through emotional abuse that you made to think that you need the perpetrator. And you don't realize that the box is shrinking or that it's making you smaller. And you don't yet understand that you will never ever be tiny enough to fit or silent enough to avoid a rye because these aren't just normal rise. And no matter what you do or what you change or how you get there, that is the biggest trick. And so getting into an abusive relationship can happen to absolutely anybody. And it's really important in your understanding of domestic abuse when you fully believe that this can happen to anyone, that that's a real key to understanding it and supporting other people. So what she kind of talked about is that kind of when you're in that box, there's a kind of conditioning and it's from that conditioning that you become dependent on the perpetrator. And then it's from that that you become entrapped. And so the coercive control legislation really helped expand that entrapment that people feel in an abusive relationships, where your options, your choices, and your ability to decide for yourself diminishes further and further. And the tactics of micromanaging, degrading, shaming, and fear, and the surveillance of the survivor is what goes on in an abusive relationship. So one of the key things to kind of think about when you're thinking about coercive control is that um, coercive control really instills fear because domestic abuse is about the context and the consequences. So we can all be controlling or manipulating occasionally, but if someone is frightened or scared of their partner's reactions the consequences if they don't do what they say then this is abuse and fear is at the heart of domestic abuse kind of coercive control so this isn't about conflict 
because and an unhealthy relationship. So when people are in conflict in a relationship, then that can be resolved usually through negotiation, through compromise or just kind of leaving it. But when you're in a controlling, coercive relationship, there is no negotiation and there is no compromise. And those are the key things to really understanding that. And the other thing is that coercive control is so effective because it, it crosses social space. The perpetrator doesn't even have to be with the survivor for the survivor to be complying to what um, the perpetrator says. So abuse can have a massive impact on individual lives, on family lives, which then spills in community if you really understand domestic abuse. So we're just going to show you um, a video. And um, this video is um, people telling us their experience of domestic abuse. It felt like being in prison. He started telling me to hurt myself and taunting me for not hurting myself badly enough. He eventually got me hooked onto heroin. It wasn't until our father had killed our own sister that we actually realised just how dangerous control is. Coercive control is an insidious form of abuse. You're actually going to wear that. For too long it has gone unnoticed and it can ruin lives. For many victims, it is an isolating secret they bear alone. Who are you talking to? I'm not talking to anyone, I'm just doing yeah, you my are, video. You're lying. I'm not, I'm no, doing I told my video. you not to talk to people. Coercive control is a subtle form of abuse. The survivor may not even recognise it as abusive. It's a repeated pattern of behaviours, stripping away a survivor's self-esteem, and it can increase the isolation of the survivor in that relationship. What's really important for um, people to understand is that they may not even recognise that they are actually a victim of domestic abuse. A mum's net survey said 38% of women have been in an abusive or controlling relationship, with six in 10 saying they suspected a friend or family member was in one. Sadie is one of them. She entered into an arranged marriage at 19. It started off with language, then it started off with how I was walking and talking. If I sat down, I, you don't sit down like that. You need to sit down slower like, than this. How you stand, you don't, don't stand like that. I'm an educated man, you need to stand like this. And then it went on to who I was going to meet and whether I should be in contact with them. The clothes that I wore, I didn't buy my clothes. He bought all of my clothes. I knew it was wrong. I went for the phone and this time he threatened to kill me. He said I was going to bring shame on my father. That was the last thing I wanted. My father was my life. It's hard because you don't have anywhere to turn to. And when you don't have any support, then you start believing that you there is something wrong with you, that you are at fault, that you are making this happen. It's your fault that he's angry. It's your fault that he's violent. So, yeah, it was really lonely. It was really lonely, yeah. Mumsnet found 24% of the victims of domestic abuse never said anything to anyone about what they were going through. Perpetrators are very clever. It's like a drip, drip, drip effect. Over time, your own perception of reality is diminished. Chloe was 13 when she met her partner. Um, I met my boyfriend on Twitter, online. 
I don't know, I don't think I thought something wasn't right for like a really long time. Like it took such long because things built up so gradually, like each thing I was just like, well, it's just another little thing. Um, I think looking back, there were signs from the very beginning that something wasn't right. He could go from being like, he'd be really lovely when we met and then in between he'd be really, really unpleasant. Um, I think like there were lots of little things he did that were quite controlling like he could like lose his temper if maybe just like me liking the wrong Facebook page or like he'd tell me like he liked girls to dress a certain way like he'd say oh I only find people attract girls attractive if they wear like short dresses and like low tops and that kind of thing and then if I dressed like that when I was with him afterwards he'd like shout at me for being a slag and a slut I was constantly like monitoring my behavior and trying to think like what have I done to make him think this and what can I do to make him like stop getting angry what am I doing wrong um and he started like self-harming and saying he he stashed pills for an overdose and he said he was going to kill himself but that if I told anyone he'd do it straight away and it'd be all my fault so it's all just a way to kind of keep to keep control over you and to have some kind of power I guess in some cases Abusers use addiction to control their partners. We were really good friends at first. I really thought this man was the one. Um, progressively, things got worse. Um, he would want to know where I was all the time. The niggling in the ear, you know, my family were no good. Eventually... I ended up with him and me. So he would always say, it doesn't matter. It's me and you against the world. You're my world. It's me and you against the world. He, he, he used to drink an awful lot, but he used to take drugs as well. And he eventually got me hooked onto heroin. I remember the first day he came home with heroin. He said, just try it. And I got very, very sick. And he said, don't worry about the sickness. Keep doing it. You'll get over the sickness. And within a month, I was hooked. Literally hooked. And then, of course, by then, he had every bit of control over my life. Um, and my life and his life literally spiraled out of control. Under legislation introduced in 2015... Coercive control became a crime. The law defines coercive control as an act or a pattern of acts of assault, threats, humiliation and intimidation or other abuse that is used to harm, punish or frighten their victim. Controlling behaviour is a range of acts designed to make a person subordinate and or dependent. By isolating them from sources of support, exploiting their resources and capacities for personal gain, depriving them of the means needed for independence, resistance and escape, and regulating their everyday behaviour. It is currently punishable by a maximum sentence of five years jail time, although sentences are often much less. Coercive and controlling behaviour was criminalised nearly three years ago, but it continues to be a largely misunderstood and underreported offence. 1.2 million women experienced domestic abuse last year alone, yet the convictions in the last year or two have been a handful, around 300. While controlling behaviour is a serious offence, it can often be the first step towards a much more serious crime, as Ryan and Luke Hart know all too well. Domestic abuse costs lives. The Hart brothers are making such a difference because by talking about the coercive and controlling behaviour of their father, who ultimately exercised total control, they're explaining the dangers of coercive and controlling behaviour and how seriously we have to take it in our society. Yeah, so on the 19th of July 2016, um, my mum and my sister met up with our dad to exchange documents and to start to formalise a divorce. Uh, they met in a swimming pool car park in Spalding. Um, our father was there uh, with a sawn-off shotgun and he killed them both in cold blood that morning. 
the thing that we realized retrospectively was that control is abuse and we'd never considered that um, as young children we grew up with our father setting boundaries for us and we perceived that they were natural our father knew to control a woman you create dependency it wasn't until our father had killed our own sister that we actually realized just how dangerous control is When we looked back over our father's behaviours, it became clear that every single one of them was designed to restrict our lives. And actually, he'd got to the point where he'd almost forced us to leave because we had so little life left with him. And that in itself was indicative of the danger, I think. The important thing to know about coercive control um, and domestic abuse is that the perpetrator behaves differently to the victims does the general public and the family, friends and outside of the home. Our father was completely different when we had friends over than when we were alone at home. The control was put in place before we were ever in any way conscious of what was going on. Many of the stories follow a chillingly similar pattern. It was fine for the first 12 months, 18 months. It started off as one little thing and then got bigger and bigger. Whatever I did, however hard I tried to like monitor everything I said to him, like every way I behaved around him, he'd always find another reason like to get angry. In an abusive relationship, it's all about an imbalance of power and control and the perpetrator has that control over the victim. So the difficulties for a victim of domestic abuse is even recognising that they're being abused in the first place. I started to notice that my friends were disappearing. He made it difficult for me to, to have other friends and to talk to other people because like, I felt like I should be, I need to sort of reply to his messages all the time. He never rang me and said, hi, how are you? first words would be, where are you, what are you doing? And I'd show him, and it got to the stage where I would automatically show him on the phone where I was. I wasn't allowed to go near a phone, I wasn't allowed to go to the bathroom. But at the time it was like my first relationship and I just thought, well maybe this is what it's supposed to be like. You don't, you don't think anything, I just thought this was what marriage was. When someone's controlling like that they're doing it to have power over you and to control you and it it does just get gradually worse and worse slow poisoning is a good way to describe coercive control it's not a one-off incident it's a repeated pattern of behaviors designed to isolate intimidate control and frighten your partner the control with him was the look he didn't have to say anything if i saw the look I would be on eggshells. And I just thought, this is my life. This is what I have to do. I have to deal with it the best way I can. I just sat and spoke to myself to tell myself that something good was going to come out of this. Leaving an abusive relationship can be complex, but talking to someone is the first step. Nobody should be frightened of their partner. If you're frightened of your partner and you're worried even about talking to somebody for fear of what they might do or think of you, then try to find the courage to speak to somebody about it. The National Domestic Violence Helpline is always there for you. If you are worried about your own life or your safety or that of another person in your life, the emergency services are there for you and you should always feel you can go to the police if that's what you wish to do. We've had a lot of training now in this area so that we're, I think, a lot better in recognising the victim's concerns and worries about coming forward and speaking to us. I drove to the police station. I just snapped. Oh, I can't do this anymore. Sat outside the police station crying. 
which I'd done on numerous occasions before and hadn't had the strength to walk in. But this time I knew, I knew it was over and I knew I had to do something about it. So I walked into the police station, asked for help. Two amazing police officers from domestic abuse unit came down to see me. Seven and a half hours later, I came out of the police station. After I spilled, I literally, once I started talking to them, I couldn't stop. Everything came out. And it was like such a relief. Such a relief. It can be hard to spot from the outside, but people should be aware of the danger signs. Every relationship is different and every abusive relationship is different. But some of the warning signs could be perhaps your friend or, or family member is becoming isolated, withdrawn. It looks as though they're being prevented by their partner for seeing friends or family. Perhaps they're mentioning that their moves are being monitored by their partner on social media and the phone. Most importantly of all, they may report feeling frightened by what their partner's doing or threatening to do to them. Perpetrators of coercive controlling behaviour are very clever at manipulating situations so that the victim feels like their behaviour and their family life and their relationship is normal when clearly it isn't. It's so important that all of us have a little bit of knowledge and confidence so that if somebody opens up to us about their abusive relationship, we know to listen to them, believe them and support them. We need to empower people to know that this isn't right in any format and we need to get people to speak up, to stand out and to take action. Please, please be brave and get help. There is help out there. There really is help out there. And people do understand. It should be taken as seriously as all forms of abuse and there should be more help out there for people, more awareness about it and it shouldn't be something that we tolerate in society at all. It's the most difficult thing to admit that you're in that sort of relationship, but take that step and be brave, and it is be brave. Call the domestic abuse helpline um, and explain to them and let them make a judgement. You have one life and you have the right to live it in the best possible way and that you have to be happy and that you should be happy and you have a right to be happy and you have a right to be safe. Help is available. Don't suffer in silence. You're muted, Anne. Okay, so, you know, we're coming to the end, but I hope you kind of just picked up some things from that video that really powerfully shows us what domestic abuse coercive control is, but also, you know, really states clearly that as communities, we should not tolerate this at all in any way. And we just want to give you kind of just a few tips in kind of some confidence to kind of talk to people? How do you respond to this? What do I do if people tell me their experiences? And sometimes we get really kind of scared or frightened that we'll kind of open a can of worms and about really not sure about how to respond to it. And just quickly, a little quote from Mandy, who is an ambassador for Women's Aid. And what Mandy said is that for many women, when you first try and tell someone you're experiencing domestic abuse, no one listens. And the person you're telling may not recognize that you are experiencing abuse or how to ask the right questions. And it's kind of really simple. I can honestly say this to you wholeheartedly, that what people want is to be be listened to, supported and enabled to make decisions for themselves. So really listening makes um, an absolute difference to people being able to share their stories of domestic um, abuse. 
and that you know people who experience domestic abuse often want to be asked because they don't know how to start the conversations themselves and asking about the issue can generate the survivor's confidence in you that you are have the ability to understand um, their abuse and even if people kind of don't respond to your questioning but you know they're experiencing abuse at least they know that you're someone that they can come back to you when you're talking to someone who's um, experienced abuse, it's really important that you do that in a private and confidential space, that you um, let the survivor tell you what they need to, and that it's really not about kind of solving the problems or about giving advice, it's about listening. It's perfectly normal for you to kind of feel upset or powerless when you've heard someone else's pain, that's normal. But remember that the survivor has been managing the situation for a very long time and will continue to do so afterwards. And we always say that, you know, survivors are courageous, they're resilient and resourceful, and that your goal is to really um, empower survivors. And in the toolkit, we'll give you some extra um, stuff um, around that. But we really want you to know that your response to domestic abuse is really vital, that just helping acknowledging the situation is what makes a massive difference. And putting a name to the situation for the first time is huge, and that you can make a difference by just having conversations and listening to people and tell you their experience of abuse. And these are some helpline numbers that you can um, give to people as they spoke about on the video. This is the National Domestic Abuse Helpline, which is 24 hours, and they will also help people get in touch with their local services. Respect is the national um, helpline and website for people who are perpetrating domestic abuse, but also for males who are experiencing domestic abuse. Gallup, this is their number and their website for um, people who are from the LBGT plus community. Um, deaf Hope is for people who are deaf and experiencing domestic abuse. The Rising Sun, that's our number and our website. Kent County Council um, have all the domestic abuse services mapped across the county and you can click onto the map and see what local services are available. Canterbury City Council have their um, housing option teams which are really there to provide help and support around safe accommodation and to give people the advice that we need. And there's much more, but these are the kind of generic ones that will kind of give you a start to kind of helping people get in um, the right um, space. So I'm just going to pass back over to Scott. Sorry that, it, you know, it's a big subject, but I hope that you've kind of just learned really what is about coercive control and that what's really key is listening and people being around conversations about domestic abuse. Okay, over to Scott. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Anne. Thank you. Thank you for everyone for attending. Um, if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat box. Um, we've got one from Josh to start with. Um, he says that um, <coughs> he doesn't wish to exclude the abuse of women. Um, but as you, are you able to see the chat box, Anne? Sorry. Um, I'm aware women are more likely to face abuse. However, mankind.org report that 26% of, of police records of male domestic abuse are men and 61% of men have reported their abuse to mankind have never spoken about this abuse to anyone before. This suggests men do not report abuse as often as it occurs. Um, what I want to ask is to what extent do you feel normalization of violence uh, perpetrated by men um, and against them has minimalized the availability of support pathways for male abuse victims? Also, what do you believe we should do to tackle the humiliation faced by reported and unreported male survivors? Okay, so absolutely what I've said that every case of domestic abuse should be taken seriously and absolutely everybody should have the right response to domestic abuse regardless of your gender um, and um, there are you know, in terms of respect, which is the national line and there are mankind who are there to kind of give advice and support to male victims of 
domestic abuse. And I think, um, you know, nationally with women and with men who experience domestic abuse, we know that there is massive underreporting in both of that, and that both genders feel shame, guilt, and isolation around um, coming forward um, for support. Support. So yeah, the more that we can do to raise awareness about anybody who's experienced domestic abuse and listening to everybody is um, kind of absolutely key. And yeah, I mean, most people don't report, most people don't come forward. And often it's when it gets to that real crisis point that maybe the police are involved and or they've gone to hospital or maybe someone's being murdered, but it's those high escalation and we need to do much more in our community to um, be preventing this and much more with um, early interventions, doing much more around teaching healthy and safe relationships, about doing awareness with gender stereotyping, um, all of that. So yeah, it's not that um, in any way we would not think that men experience domestic abuse. It's something that we can do um, for tackling the humiliation faced by reported and unreported both male and female so just trying to tackle that uh, perception that it's a shame to be reporting that so i feel that's something that we can work on as a community safety partnership with the, with the police and things to see if there's something that we can add um to some of our comms as well so thank you for that josh um louise has asked a very asked a question hello there can you hear me okay because i'm plugged in my headphones yeah okay so I'm, I'm kind of here today sort of it's um my reasoning is twofold I'm actually a survivor myself but I, I'm also a Canterbury City Councillor so so I'm here really um wearing both both badges um how do people um get in get involved with the charity I mean obviously through the council um I, I can take care of the aspect through the council but as a as an individual and a survivor how how do people get get involved? Um, is there is there training for individuals? What would be um, the path to take for somebody that wants to get involved? Sorry, do you want to answer that, Judy? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Louise. Um, yeah. So there's a sorry. Excuse me. <clears throat> been too quiet for too long um yeah there's a number of ways to get involved we do offer training um we don't have any planned at the moment but we i can definitely um take your email address and add you to an email list to be notified when there is more training and then uh, we are a charity of course so we uh have arranged fundraising and um presentations things like this webinar to try and um, involve people as much as possible um, but I'll send you an email, uh, well, I'll send everyone an email with my contact details um, and anyone who wants to get in any way involved to help is, you know, fantastic. That's great, thank you. Oh yeah, sorry, and uh, there is also um, our one-stop shops, which are, um, they run across uh, Kent in uh, different locations on different days, and they are, in Rising Sun is present and another and other domestic abuse agencies and then other agencies as well to offer advice and support for survivors. Uh, so there'll be housing, some solicitors and different agencies that can help. And then they are, they run across Kent and they, you don't need an appointment and people can just attend and ask any questions that they have um, with experts there. Yeah. And we also have um, a forum for survivors of domestic abuse as well. So honestly, if anybody's keen to be involved or, you know, um, to support or to just kind of volunteer or do that, then just please get in touch. And we're really happy for people to support because um, the good thing is about the Rice and Sun is it's been around the Canterbury district for 40 years. So it's been here supporting people in our community. So it is a, a community project. And so the more people from community that we listen to and are involved with, then that's much um, better. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Anne. And thank you, Judith. Um, a question from uh, another Josh. Uh, how common do you find abusive situations within friendships as opposed to romantic relationships? And would you tailor advice any differently? So I guess part of the question also is if class is domestic abuse. Okay, so that in terms of the the kind of legislation, um, friendship is not a kind of um, 
included within that. It's about a kind of intimate relationship, a romantic relationship or a, a, a family um, member. But there are lots of other kind of legislation and lots of other things around in terms of feeling if people are feeling bullied or controlled or, you know, harassed within that friendship, then there, you know, there are lots of the services that we'd kind of um, definitely support and there is legislation in place to um, support that as well. But when we're talking about domestic abuse, we're often talking about that, that kind of intimate relationship or a family member. Um, and so I think probably Scott, that's you in terms of, I mean, lots of the legislation around kind of, um, if you're experiencing um, that from a friend. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you, Joshua, for asking the question. Um, are there any further questions? It's 1.58 at the moment. If anyone does find any questions after the after we've finished and you've just logged off and gone, ah, oh, I've just thought of a question, then please feel free to email myself at csu at canterbury.gov.uk or Judith, um, who you will have already had the email from inviting you to uh, this webinar. So you can get hold of Judith directly through that email. Um, thank you again very much to everyone for joining us today. I hope you found it as interesting and as useful as I have. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's being recorded, so we will be putting this on our Community Safety Partnership YouTube channel, and we'll be putting together a document, a toolkit on the Council website to support this as well with useful links and answers to some of the questions that we raised um, and some other useful advice and information from the presentation. So. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, just before we go, have we got um, anyone else has got any other questions before we go? We could have talked longer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm just going to put my email address in the chat box in case anyone needs it. And um, thank you very much, and I hope you all have uh, a lovely day. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.